Patrick Wyman, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you very much for having me on. So uh, you have a podcast that's come out fairly recently. I'm not sure how you discovered it originally. It's called The Fall of Rome, but I'm glad I did because it's completely fascinating. You're taking listeners through the history of the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, I think it's an interesting topic because the fall of Rome has become this cultural touchstone in the West. Um, And it's used as a warning for what can happen to a society as it gets off the right track. I'm curious, what do you, why do you think the fall of Rome has become such an indelible part of our cultural consciousness? Why are we always thinking about it? Well, I think that there are a number of different dimensions to this. Um, So I think in a historical sense, it goes back to the kind of structure of Western education in the 18th and 19th centuries and the heavy emphasis on the classics and the tendency of the educated classes in uh, France and especially in uh, and especially in Great Britain to see themselves as the heirs of Rome. So they were engaged in processes of very consciously drawing parallels between their own times and the Roman Empire. And over the course of a couple of centuries, that kind of worms its way into your cultural consciousness. So I think that's the, the first piece of it. But the second piece is that the Roman Empire is still the gold standard for imperial rule, for political control, for for cultural greatness. So I also think that there was there was a long-running tendency to see Rome as the gold standard for what was possible with imperial rule. Because culturally, I think the Roman Empire was a touchstone for the kind of educated elites and the edu- and increasingly the educated middle class in the West in the in the 18th and the 19th centuries because that was their that was their educational background. They read Greek and Latin um, when they were when they were going to school, and so it was natural to draw parallels between their own time and uh, and and the Roman Empire. So, if you have the Roman Empire as a cultural touchstone, as a as as uh, through its literary products, through uh, through tours of Italy, the Grand Tour, where you were, where you were going and looking at Roman monuments, um, it was natural to draw parallels between your own time and the and the Roman world. And one of those things that you had to that you had to wonder about was, okay, well, if this lasted for so long, why did it fall? Why did it crash? And I think that uh, Edward Gibbon's *Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire*, one of the great works of Western literature. Um, kind of embedded that particular perspective, the, these these deep uh, ongoing questions of decline and fall. So now when we get into the 20th and the 21st centuries and you have the rise of the Soviet Union and the rise of the and, and the rise of the United States as as the two superpowers of the world, now just the one superpower, you have to start asking those questions again because this is this is part of our cultural consciousness. This idea of the Roman Empire is the kind of uh, the uh, the eternal, unending, uh, unending empire. So you have to ask questions about your own time and that, and that includes how does it end? I think uh, for Americans in particular, Rome is you know, captures the imagination because like our whole country was basically inspired by. Roman governance or Roman culture. All the founders were steeped in that. They were, they thought they, they'd often call themselves like the new Cato or the new Hannibal, right? Like they were the American Hannibal. Yeah, absolutely. That these were, these were not just like pieces of cultural DNA that were kind of floating beneath the surface. These were intentional parallels that, that the founding fathers were drawing. I mean, I think especially Jefferson, um, because I, more than, more than any other founding father, he was the most steeped in these kinds of theories of governance. So let's talk about the different theories about why the Roman Empire fell, because there's a ton of them out there. There's tons of books about this where everyone's putting out a different theory. Um, So what are the most common theories of why the Roman Empire fell? Well, so they basically break down into two broad categories. I would say that the, the first category is the barbarians did it. This is the uh, Rome. Rome. Uh, Rome was not. Uh, or the Rome was murdered. Rome. Uh, Rome was assassinated. Um, this is especially common in kind of in French historiography. Then there's the other, which is that Rome was. Uh, cre- it was a creaking kind of rotten empire in the fourth and the fifth centuries, and it died a basically natural death. So both of these perspectives in some way, shape, or form, have to engage with the barbarians. That did the did the barbarians do it, or was Rome just kind of waiting to be kind of gently nudged over the edge? Um, I kind of tend toward a mixture of those two perspectives. I think that the the Roman Empire in the in the third, fourth, and into the fifth century was a basically functional state as long as the people who were at the center of it were competent and did their jobs well, which was the case for most of the fourth century. In the fifth century, when um, when the when the people at the centers of power in both the in both the west and the east were were less competent, uh, external forces, the barbarians, uh, trade shocks, 
um, plague, things like that could have a much more, it could have a much more devastating effect. Yeah. And you mentioned in your first episode, I believe that um, there's been new discoveries via archaeology or just, you know, history um, that have challenge these these ideas that it was the barbarians or it was just the sort of decay that happened. I mean, what's changed in the past few years where there or historians like yourself and others are saying, well, maybe it's not those theories. I mean, what 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 new information has been uncovered? Well, so it, it's largely archaeological and most of it has to do with, uh, well, with a few different things. So I think first and foremost, it's with the barbarians that we understand, we have a much better understanding of the world beyond Rome's borders and how closely tied together Rome and the barbarian world were. I mean, it's not like the legionaries were, were sitting on the frontier staring out into a vast unknown, like they they interacted constantly with the barbarians that um, Rome was heavily managed in or was heavily involved in kind of managing what went on beyond its borders either through a combination of financial inducement uh, alliances and military force that it that it had the carrot and the stick um, and that this engendered really close connections between those worlds Roman traders went out and went out there uh, to sell goods they brought slaves back um, barbarians served in the Roman military in increasingly large numbers that these worlds were not in any way, shape, or form unfamiliar to each other. I th- so I think that's the that's the biggest one. We understand how closely connected these worlds were to one another and how thin and permeable those boundaries were. Um, the second one has to do, I would say, with the scale of the Roman economy. We understand much better now uh, because of uh, really intensive increased excavations and a better understanding of, of all things pottery. Um, because pottery is a proxy marker for exchange networks. The goods have to move in containers, and in the Roman world, those goods moved in amphorae. Amphorae, little fragments of those pottery shards, uh, tend to survive really well. So we can track in really great detail the movements of goods from one place to another, and that gives us a really clear picture of the scale of the Roman economy. Like I think we understand how much bigger, uh, how much bigger it was, and how much more like our own economy it was than than what came before and what came after it. Okay, so we'll we'll get into more detail about the relation between uh, the Roman Empire and the barbarians, as well as the the scale, the geography of the Roman Empire. But let's talk about some definitions, some basic definitions first. Um, what exactly do we mean when we say the Roman Empire fell? Because I, we throw that around word around quite a bit, but I I think most of us, most people, don't have a vague idea of what it means. We know the Roman Empire doesn't exist anymore, um, but what did what do we mean it fell? Like what what was the process that went on? So that's this is I, I was kind of remiss in answering your question about how views of these things have changed earlier. But this is this is the big thing. What do we what do we mean when we talk about the fall of Rome? Um, so it used to be that people thought that people thought in terms of a really drastic decline, and the kind of pushback against that in scholarly circles has has been to treat this as a transformation. To say that instead of looking at looking at these series of interlocking things that happened as as a drastic decline and a drastic fall, um, because that implies a value judgment. To say that no, just things changed. I mean, I think that goes a little bit too far with it. Um, I think that it's possible to it's possible to overstate the case. I think that mater- in material terms and in terms of quality of life, in a lot of places, things really did get worse. Uh, but with that said, um, to come back to to come back to the idea of fall. You're talking about a lot of different things. I tend to take a broad view. Um, and I think that, first of all, you're dealing with political transformations, where once you had uh, a unified state stretching from the north of Britain to the Sahara, you ha- it was replaced with a patchwork of individual kingdoms. That's, f- that's the first one. Um, you have religious transformations. You have ethnic transformations, demographic transformations, um, rises in population in particular places, but more generally decline in population. You have um, the, end of, the end of urbanism, of city life in large stretches of, of what had been the Roman Empire. So like the Roman world was a whole complex of different things that together made up the, made up the Roman Empire. It's not just a political thing. If you want to de- define it really narrowly, you can do that. But I think it's a much broader kind of thing when we're talking about the end of the, end of the Roman world, of the, the various structures and institutions and complexes that the Romans had built. And to me, the biggest one is economic, that the, that the Roman world was defined by easy movement, communication, and trade uh, in in large volumes from place to place. And so to me, the end of the Roman world is the end of that particular set of systems. And the politics, while they're important, are almost secondary to that. And so yeah, going, going back to how big it is, so you said it stretched from like the Sahara to like all the way to England. Um, that's north-south. How far like east-west did it go? 
So all the way from the, the very tip of Spain in the Atlantic uh, to the Euphrates River in the east at its, at its greatest extent. So all the way from, basically from Iraq to Spain was part of the Roman Empire, from the, from the Sahara in the south to, to Great Britain in the north and to the, and to the North Sea. And you said that they were able to you know, move people, goods, communicate quickly. So what did the Romans do that allowed them to do that sort of across vast uh, spaces of geography? So tremendous infrastructure. Um, it, it's infrastructure and scale. So the Romans built exceptional ports. They built uh, they built an, an unbelievable road system that still underpins the road system practically everywhere in Western Europe. Like if you're if you're riding along a highway in Spain, France, Britain, uh, Italy, chances are good that it follows basically the same route as a road the Romans laid out anywhere between uh, anywhere between 1800 and 2200 years ago. Um, so that's that's the scale. Of the infrastructure achievement that the that the Romans built, but but its ports uh, and the and the other part of it is state expenditures. So the Romans, uh, so the Romans, for the purposes of the uh, of the army, which was the the single biggest institution in the Roman world, had to move massive amounts of food, um, supplies, people to do that. So that created a kind of a basic network of movement of goods and people from place to place. On top of which. Private traders and uh, private traders could build their own markets. So if you have huge ships transporting massive amounts of grain from Sicily or North Africa to Rome to feed the populace, it's really easy to piggyback on top of the infrastructure that was built to do that to move other kinds of goods and people from place to place. And um, you know, it got so big at one point they they split it right. There's that the Western Roman Empire and the Eastern Roman Empire. When did that happen, and why did it happen? So the the final split came in 395 with the death of Theodosius the Great, who is the last emperor to rule bo- to rule the entirety of both halves of the empire. Uh, his son Arcadius took over in the east, and his son Honorius took over in the west. Um, but the split goes back before it goes back a, a fair ways before that too. So for most of the fourth century, aside from the emperor Constantine, you had had separate emperors in the east and the west, um, and. When you have separate emperors in the east and the west, the split that becomes formalized in 395, you have different courts built up around each of those emperors. You have different you have different army units. You have different institutions, each of which are looking to different poles of governance. But you also have a cultural split between the two. The east is largely Greek speaking, uh, and the west is almost entirely Latin speaking. In addition to the kind of local languages that were bubbling beneath the surface, so you had you had cultural splits. But but the final administrative split comes at the at the beginning of the fifth century. And why did that split happen? It just sort of happened naturally. I mean, it just got too big, and they just thought, oh, okay, we'll just put some guy in charge in that one area. They were just trying to be pragmatic about it. Is that what happened? Yeah, that's that's basically it. So so the be- the real beginning of the formal split goes back to the emperor Diocletian at the end of the third century, beginning of the fourth century. And Diocletian totally reorganized from top to bottom the Roman state. Like he formalized the he formalized this. And he thought, okay, well, we need to have not one emperor, not even two emperors, but four emperors. That you need to have a a a key emperor in the west and a key emperor in the east and then he needs to have a junior person under him. And so when you have that kind of administrative setup from the beginning, that creates a whole set of institutions around each of those emperors. The, the, point, the basic idea at that point was, yeah, there's just too much for any one person to handle here. And because if you delegate power to somebody else, then they're going to rise up. They're going to try and usurp the throne. The emperors were always, always, always to the very end of the empire more worried about a usurper than they were about any sort of potential external threat from the Persians, from the from from any barbarian group, from whatever, because that was a threat to their basic legitimacy. Well, okay, so with that threat in mind, I mean, how did the the two capitals, um, the two like the various emperors, how did they interact with each other? Did they get along pretty well, or were they always kind of like, I don't know about this guy. I'm, I got to get along with them because we're on the same team, but that guy could take over. It ran, it ran the gamut, you know. Um, you had some cases. Uh, there was always a bit of wariness about it, but you had some cases of relatively close uh, interaction between the two and cooperation between the two. So the great irony of the Goths, uh, like massive defeat of uh, of the Emperor Valens at the Battle of Adrianople in 378 AD, is huge turning point in Roman history. An emperor dies on the battlefield. The whole Eastern Roman field army uh, is is destroyed on the battlefield. The great irony of that is that there was an army from the West that was coming to help the Emperor Valens, um, but he decided that he couldn't afford to to take the hit to his reputation if he waited for that army. So at some points, there's real cooperation, whether you know somebody like a, a kind of an incompetent like Valens could take it or not. Um, that there was there was close cooperation, but at other points there was 
almost open conflict between the two, especially if you had, uh, especially if you had a usurper on one side or the other, that that could engender military action from the other side. So that happened on a couple of different occasions. And so was that the, the split? Was that a factor that played into the fall of Rome? Yeah, because the East was generally wealthier um, and its institutions were were kind of better grounded. Uh, and also, just kind of by pure luck, over the course of the 5th century, the East managed to find some some really competent people to help run things, where in the West, those people just never really, those people just never really showed up. Um, there was, the West was always poor, and it was always home to more usurpations, so it was easier for pieces of the Western Empire to get kind of carved out. Also, most of, most the of East, it was the focused around the Mediterranean, when in the West, that kind of the orientation of the frontier provinces of places like Britain and Gaul was not naturally toward the Mediterranean. That was kind of an artificial construct um, that you were move. You had to keep moving through the offices of the state, large gr- large amounts of men and materiel to kind of continue to keep those places tied in. When those mechanisms started to break down a little bit, it was really easy for those for those provinces to to kind of spin off, uh, to spin off and spin away, and reorient themselves in other directions. So it was just easier for the East to keep things to keep things grounded and keep things centered. Everywhere's closer to the Mediterranean. There's more money. The cities are older and better established. Um, and the and then on top of all that, you have more competent people. So I mean, I mean, yeah, the Eastern Empire. Um, I mean, it. I mean, technically, kind of, you could say it went on into the 1400s, right? The, the mm-hmm. 13th century. So I mean, like, I mean, is that like? Do historians consider that part of the Roman Empire? So like, when we say the Roman Empire fell, well, part of it continued um, for centuries longer. So like, what do again? I go back to like, what do you mean by it? it the Roman Empire fell when a part of it continued. Yeah, when we talk about fall, we're talking um, we're talking exclusively about the West. I mean, the that what remained in the East, like the the Byzantine Empire, the or the Eastern Empire, whatever we want to call it, was still the superpower of the Mediterranean world. Um, I mean, it was still the most powerful state in the Mediterranean world up until the uh, up until like the 12th or the 13th century. Um, up until the Crusaders sacked Constantinople in 1204, if you had to point to one individual state as being the most powerful and the most important one. It was the Eastern Empire because it had Constantinople, but also because it had this long tradition and this long history. And they certainly considered themselves Romans, um, you know, to the extent that uh, the the Seljuk Turks in uh, in Anatolia, who would eventually go on to found the Ottoman Empire, they called themselves the Seljuks of Rome, of the Seljuks of Rome, Um, that this was the the, this was the reputation of that particular side of the empire, even if in the West they weren't necessarily considered to be Roman in the same way. Interesting. So, uh, when did the fall of the empire begin, and why? Why is that year the starting point for you? So, I, I pick the the entry of the Goths into the empire in three seventy six. That for me is a starting point. You could go earlier. You could point to the crisis of the third century when kind of everything went to hell in a handbasket all at once for uh, for the Roman world. But I pick the entry of the Goths because at that point the empire was more or less stable. It was run by competent people, um, but things changed when the when the Goths entered through a through a series of things, none of which had to be inevitable. Like there's a lot of, you have to remember with all of this, there's a lot of chance involved um, that this was the first time where you had a, a barbarian group having as much success as the Goths did, where they essentially forced a settlement. Um, before, when barbarian groups had entered the empire, they were either settled under, they were either settled under under negotiated terms, but clearly in a subordinate position, or uh, or they were defeated and driven back beyond enslaved in large numbers. Um, the Goths were the first group to be able to, to some extent, dictate the terms of their settlement, to form uh, something like a separate power block between within the empire. And it was a blueprint that would be carried out by a number of different groups after that. So I think that marks a, an important turning point in the relationship between the Romans and the people beyond the borders. And then at what year do you, do you say it ended and why do you pick that year? That's that's a harder question. Uh, for me, I pick uh, the campaigns of Justinian in the 530s. So Justinian, a Roman, the the emperor in the east. Justinian uh, went and reconquered large portions of the Western Empire. And for me, that's an important distinction. Is um, 
he was it, like it, it forced people in the West to come to terms with the fact that for the past 60, 80, 100 years before that point, they hadn't been living in the Roman Empire anymore. For a long time, people could kind of maintain the illusion that things had not really changed all that much, especially in Italy, where you had a barbarian king, sure, but that wasn't really all that much different from a world where you had a puppet emperor and barbarian generals running things. Um, when Justinian sent Eastern Roman armies to reconquer the West, suddenly you had to come to terms with the fact that your whole mental framework was kind of off, that things that, that things really had changed, whether you could, whether you were aware of that or not. That for me is a really important kind of mental, mental turning point. But also, um, that's the point where the the kind of Roman world system, where the easy connections between places, the the easy movement of goods and of goods and people, where that started to change dramatically too. You also had a massive plague at that point that reduced populations. Um, Justinian's wars, in and of themselves, caused great deal of damage in in various places. Again, large population decline. So that, to me, is the point where the where things have become so markedly different that we talk about the that we talk we can talk about the end of the fall. So let's talk about the barbarians, um, because you, know, you use that the entry of the Goths into the empire um, as the starting point of the fall of Rome, and that's the common narrative that the bar- barbarians came in and sort of took over to decay- decaying regime. But what what were the barbarians like? Because I think a lot of people when they they hear the word barbarian, they imagine like guys wearing like eating you know meat off a bone, um, you know wearing you know wolf you know helmets or whatever on their head. I mean so. Were they sort of these brutes or were they actually, they actually have a very sophisticated culture? So they, they had a really sophisticated culture. They had, uh, they had, uh, well, they had well thought out laws. There were, there were increasingly strong, uh, social hierarchies. These were organized societies. Like that's the, when when I mentioned earlier, the archeology span that, that had come, that has come to light and the sophistication of the barbarian world, a large part of that has to do with, we realize now how densely populated the barbarian world was. Like there wasn't, uh, it's not like you crossed the border and things were deserted and you just had these like little groups of, of fur wearing savages hanging out there. Like the, the density of settlement in the barbarian world is kind of staggering for us to for us to think about like anywhere where they've done detailed field surveys and tried to figure out okay how many people were actually living here at a given time the answer has always been higher than anybody expected so um, these were this was an increasingly populated an increasingly politically sophisticated world where <clears throat> um, over the course of the third century kind of as a result of Roman imperial weakness and into the fourth century um, barbarian tribal confederations grew up beyond the boundaries of the empire so I mentioned before how the Romans had gone about managing the world beyond their borders. And the way that they did that was to try to prevent any one king, any one tribal chieftain from becoming too powerful. So you would subsidize some, you would attack others, uh, you would try and you would try and uh, co-opt uh, still others by bringing their children into the empire um, or offering them ranks, titles, things like that. In the third century, when Roman attention was kind of focused inward, it allowed the the barbarian groups beyond the borders to become more powerful than they had ever been before. It allowed them to organize in the absence of Roman attention uh, into larger, much more powerful confederations. So this is when we first start to see groups like the Franks, the Alemanni, and above all, the Goths. This is when they appear in the sources, and they appear in a context of Roman imperial weakness and, uh, and diverted attention. Um, so... But they're increasingly sophisticated, you know, they're inc- and they're increasingly tied into the Roman world. There's you, you can find more coinage, like more Roman coinage in the Gothic lands beyond the Danube from the 4th century than you can in the Roman provinces on the other side of the Danube in the 4th century. They've got monetary economies, large amounts of imports and exports. Um, but to me, the really interesting thing here is the kind of increasing military integration between the barbarians and the Romans. So if you're a Roman general and you need troops, you're, you're on the border in the fourth century, um, it's a lot easier to recruit barbarians, people who, uh, people who have traditions of military service, uh, who, are, who are not necessarily warlike by nature, but are more socialized into that kind of violence. It's, more, it's easier to recruit them and train them and have them be your long service Roman soldiers than it is to try and recruit provincials, um, like Roman provincials into the army. So over the course of the fourth century and into the fifth century, the line between a barbarian group and a Roman army becomes thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner. So when you have the, who eventually sack Rome, right? Like at various points, 
all they're looking to do is uh, is get a proper bill, a proper Roman imperial billet. Like it's basically a Roman army that's kind of that happens to be composed mostly of Goths. So the line between a barbarian people and a Roman army is kind of thin, and the Roman army adopts increasingly barbarian styles because they think they're cool. Um, like they want to wear barbarian style clothing. They want to they want to have. Um, like I th- there in some cases there are references to tattoos. They want to use ro- they want to uh, like uh, they use barbarian names because they think they sound cool. They have a, a particular army style of Latin that's heavily inflected with bar- with uh, with Germanic words. Uh, that the barbarians in the Roman military became become increasingly hard to distinguish from one another uh, because to be a barbarian is to be a soldier and to be a soldier is to be a barbarian. So the kinds of identities get really intertwined with each other. So uh, just to, just to clarify, so I mean, it sounds like we say the barbarians lived outside the borders of the Roman empire, but it sounds like, you know, if they lived in France, like the Franks or the, the Goths who lived in, you know, what German, what is now Germany, like weren't those part of the Roman empire? Wasn't those areas part of the Roman empire? Well, so the, yeah, so they lived beyond the borders, but the frontiers are pretty porous. You know, you had large numbers of Goths who lived within the boundaries of the Roman Empire. You had large numbers of Franks who lived within the boundaries of the Roman Empire. Even if those barbarian groups had their political leaders outside, um, the individual people and groups of people could could and did still migrate regularly into the within the boundaries of the empire. Gotcha. And so you're going back to those names. Uh, there's an episode where you dedicate, where you kind of create a a fictional barbarian um like what his life was like and what it would have been like um and you talk about some of the names i thought they were they sounded like they they do sound kind of cool what were some of the names common names of barbarians and that maybe a roman soldier may might adopt for himself oh so there's a so the the hypothetical goth that i came up with his name is volfila uh, that that's uh, that was a fairly common Gothic name. There's a uh, Marcomer, Claudio uh, for the Franks, um, Ricimer, Gundobad, names like that. Like in this particular kind of militarized environment, even people who even people who weren't of barbarian descent might give their children those names again because I think they sounded cool. They thought that sounds like that sounds like a military name. I'm going to name my child that. So in the sixth century in Italy, you have like. This blue-blooded Roman aristocrat uh, who uh, it, who's, who takes on some military roles, but he gives both of his sons, who are blue-blooded Roman aristocrats like himself, uh, gothic names because again they they speak to a military kind of identity to a to, to being kind of a bad dude. And so I mean, it goes to I mean, it's interesting because to me that signifies that Roman culture no longer resonated with Romans as much. Um, if they weren't giving their children Roman names. I mean, so what was the culture of Rome at that time where they would want to take more influence from the barbarians instead of looking to Rome? Well, so one of the really one of the really uh, interesting things that happens over the course of the fifth and the sixth uh, fifth and the sixth centuries is that you do see a pretty in in some areas more so than others, a pretty tremendous cultural transformation. Um, so in some regions, Let's say you've got an aristocrat who lives in kind of southern Gaul and what's today southern France in Aquitaine near Toulouse, right? You've got this guy. He can kind of go about his business without really feeling like anything major has changed. Uh, that that he he can still write letters to all of his friends. He still lives on like a super luxurious estate. He's still got a he's still got a bathhouse at his villa. Um, for people like that, things didn't really change all that much. But in other areas, if you're uh, if you're living in say the northern part of Gaul and what's today Belgium or part of the Netherlands, um, up to the up to the border with the uh, where, with the Rhine River. In that area, you can't really pretend that things haven't changed. Um, you've got a large amount of social instability that expresses itself through things like all of a sudden people start burying themselves with weapons. Um, you only do that in a context where there's where there's social instability and things like that. But what you get through large parts of the former Rome, uh, of what had been the Roman Empire is a more militarized society. So if you had one of these aristocrats living in northern Gaul, that guy, that guy couldn't pretend that things hadn't changed. He would need to take on more of a military identity. So you get one of the ways to think about the fall of the Roman Empire is to look at masculinity and to say that it changes from a particularly civic brand of masculinity that's focused around public service, oratory, literary skills, and to say that it was replaced with a military brand of masculinity. That to be a to be a man, to be an important man, 
in 6th century northern Gaul was to be a warrior in a way that to be a to be a man in 4th century southern Gaul was to be a public figure, to be a, a, a public orator, to be a man of letters. So Weirtus took control completely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, it was things that had previously been restricted to military contexts became more broadly dispersed throughout society. That's one of the defining transformations of the Roman world. And what's interesting you talk about in the podcast too is that not only were the Romans being influenced by the by the barbarians culturally, but the barbarians as well were taking on some of these Roman cultural um, manifestations. Like you talk about how these barbarian kings would have Roman type villas made of logs in in their uh, in their kingdom wherever they lived. So, I mean, what other ways were the barbarians taking on uh, Roman cultural um, I don't know status marker markers or social markers? Well, so in in many places, the markers that they that they adopt tend to come straight from the Roman military, right? So, so barbarians were big on belt buckles and brooches, but they were big on belt buckles and brooches that came from military contexts. So, when I was talking about how it becomes increasingly difficult to discern the the difference between a, a barbarian and a a barbarian and a soldier, like that's one of the things is like. Um, the the use of status markers that come out of the Roman military that like if you're a Roman general you have a particular uh, you have a particular belt buckle that you wear well those became widely dispersed among the barbarians because you know I want to look like a Roman general who doesn't um, but also in in kind of broader terms for the most part you have barbarians uh, giving up their own languages and speaking Latin. Um, like there's no evidence of the Visigoths, right? Who the Visigoths who had entered the Roman Empire in 376, who sacked Rome in 410, who eventually settled in, in southern France and then in Spain. There's basically no evidence for the Visigoths speaking Gothic after about after uh, uh, after they were settled within the Roman Empire. Basically none. They spoke, as far as I can tell, they spoke Latin. Um, that's one example. Archaeologically, a bunch of these groups are just invisible. There's no sense that they were that they completely adopted Roman material culture. And why wouldn't you? You know, like it's nice to live in villas. It's nice to have bathhouses. Like Roman clothes are comfortable. It's nice to eat off of uh, to, to eat off of like fine ceramic dishware. Um, olive oil tastes really good. Like fish sauce tastes good. Wine tastes good. Um, so like materially, a lot of these groups become completely assimilated. It's impossible to tell any sort of difference between them and the and the Roman population. They just blend in completely. Okay, so let's talk about the the the, the Goths coming into Rome because I think the idea that when people think, oh yeah, the Goths came in, they came in with like, we often imagine like they came in with their wooden shields and swords and their pelts and they just like sacked, started killing. But the way you describe it, it was more of a a mass migration into the Roman Empire. I mean, why were the Goths wanting to migrate into the Roman Empire? Well, so uh, there are a few things here. We have to bear in mind the closeness of the barbarian world and the Roman world. So there was a long tradition of barbarian groups um, who were fleeing for for whatever reason to seek refuge within the Roman Empire. There was a well uh, a well established process for this called receptio. Um, the Goths who entered in 376 did so because they were fleeing the Huns. Um, the Huns had appeared uh, not exactly out of nowhere. Our sources make it sound like that, but I don't think that's really the case. Um, the a, a nomadic steppe people um, had appeared kind of uh, north of the Black Sea and had uh, inflicted a whole bunch of defeats on uh, the, on uh, a, a particular group of Visigoths. So, or on a particular group of Goths. So. Their response is, well, the Roman world is here. We know that they're always looking for soldiers. We can fight for them as soldiers, and in return, we'll receive safety and land to settle. What's, so what's interesting here is it's not like these were unknown groups, and like all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of like fur-wearing, fur-wearing barbarians who show up on the shores of the Danube. It's that they understood what they were asking for. The Romans understood what they were asking for, and through accident, that process went awry, and we end up with a Roman emperor dead on a battlefield. But what's really striking to me is that everybody knew what to expect from this. Everybody knew what they wanted because they were operating within the same kind of cultural reference frames um, for behavior. So, I mean, it sounds like they were refugees in a way. Yeah, basically. And I think a lot of the barbarians who entered the Roman Empire were refugees. Um, we don't. There are a lot of groups that enter the Roman Empire that they're recorded going through one of these receptiones, and then we never hear from them again. They just they they're just assimilated. They just blend into the into the background of the Roman world, like which, because I mentioned, it exerted a tremendous acculturating influence on all of these groups that came in. Uh, so a lot of them are, do enter the Roman Empire as refugees. Um, others 
as we go, get later into the fifth century, more and more of them start to enter as kind of like ready-made military forces, and that changes things. That changes the re- the relationship quite a bit. So the, the initial goal then wasn't to destroy, sack the Roman, sack Rome. Oh God! Take oh over. God! No, they wanted to. They wanted to be like they were looking for the safety that the Roman Empire provided, and in large and in large part, they wanted the material comforts that Rome provided. Like there, it was this was an aspirational thing. Like the in migration theory, you talk about push factors and pull factors. Like reasons why you want to leave and reasons why you want to go to a particular place. The Roman Empire was full of pull factors. Um, There was greater opportunity. uh, You know, like if you were a talented goth living beyond the frontier, like you could join the Roman army and you could gain a life for yourself that would never have been possible beyond the frontier. Like these were like, I think to some extent, you want to look at the barbarians entering the Roman Empire as aspirational immigrants. Like in large part, they're looking for a better life. So what happened? What changed where it started out this aspiration? We just want to have part of the the Roman pie um, to when the Goths sack Rome in like the in, four, in the four hundreds. The the great irony of the Goths sack of Rome is that it was a failed negotiating tactic. Um, that the Goths who sacked Rome were led by a a, a uh, kind of a general, maybe a king called Alaric. He's one of the most famous barbarians of antiquity, Alaric or Alaric, if you want to, if you want to put it that way. Um, but so basically, he had accumulated a large military, a large army um, that was composed mostly of Goths. Many of them, the descendants of the Goths who had crossed in in 376. The 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 sack happens in 410 to give you a sense of the timing here. Um, but basically, there. Uh, they're looking for a better deal from the from the Roman state. They're looking for uh, Alaric is looking for a military command. Um, he's looking for a place for his for his soldiers to settle. Um, like that that was a standard deal. Like if you were a soldier and you and you had served for for some period of time, like you would probably get land to settle on. So Alaric is looking to secure settlement terms for for his Goths. He's looking for a position for himself. Um, his ambitions kind of grow over the course of this little rebellion, but eventually, when they get into Italy, he's he's threatening Rome as a way as a way of getting leverage in his negotiations with the imperial court. Not all that dissimilar from like the fact that they were Goths was almost irrelevant to this. Um, it could he could have been any Roman general looking for a better deal from the from the court. This this happened pretty regularly, which shows you just how screwed up things had gotten in the Western Empire by this point. Um, but Eventually, he threatens Rome twice. He gets bought off twice. Um, but finally, the negotiations break down again. He goes to threaten Rome, and he's like, "Well, I guess we just have to sack it this time." But still, by the standards of sacking a city, it was a pretty peaceful sack. Um, what the Vandals did to Rome in, in the 450s was much, much, much more devastating to the city than anything the Goths did in 410. They spared the churches. Um, like it probably wasn't pleasant for the population of Rome. But all things considered, as sacks go, if you had to get sacked. Alaric and the Goths did a did a pretty gentle job of it. Okay, all right. So get sacked by Alaric if you're going to get sacked. Um, so the, the, another idea that talks that people put out there of why the Roman Empire fell is not so much because of external in, enemies. Like that was sort of like the, the they just sort of pushed that. And the the reason why they were to fall so easily was that Romans had this moral decay within their culture and their society that made them vulnerable to these attacks. Is there any credence to that idea that Rome had? disintegrated because of moral decadence? I, I don't really think so. Um, I think that if you want to look for, uh, like, I mean, and it, so there are a couple of different ways to, to look at that. You could say that, uh, to look at the idea of moral decay. On the one hand, um, the the idea of, of Edward Gibbon and other of these old school historians is that, well, Christianity caused, the, caused this decline. Um, but you can look at plenty of Christian late Roman generals and soldiers who were plenty good at their jobs. You know, that was not, that did not seem to be a defining factor there. Um, there's also the idea that, well, you know, things had socially gotten so degenerate in terms of uh, the, that, uh, that that caused some sort of decline. I don't think that's true. I think if you're looking for a kind of a series of internal factors, it would be a politically speaking, the weakness of the imperial court, uh, which uh, grew ever more self-interested uh, ever less able to deal with the series of challenges that were that were being presented to it, which were increasingly difficult challenges over the course of the over the course of the late fourth and into the fifth century. But to me, the big thing that stands out is um, a decreasing investment of like kind of local aristocrats, not like the not like the big 
uh, landowners who were who were sitting in the Senate in Rome, but like city, but like civic leaders, that they were increasingly less invested in taking care of their cities. That seems to me to be a kind of a big overarching change over the course of the fourth and into the fifth centuries. Like you couldn't get people to fill city like the city magistracies. Um, like you people like these local prosperous people who owned uh, who who owned large amounts of land, who had little houses in the city, who's who invested their money in, in business in business operations in these cities. That they grew less and less interested in putting their resources to to work for the peoples in the or for the people in those cities. Cities cities declined for a variety of reasons, but I think that part of that is because people who a couple hundred years earlier would have been endowing buildings, uh, would have been paying for games and festivals, things like that that like this was part of the social compact between local elites and their cities, that breaks down. There are a whole bunch of reasons for that, but the fact of it seems to me to be a really big deal. Like so if you're looking for internal decline and decay outside the political sphere uh, or like outside the sphere of high politics, I think that's where you see it is this kind of breakdown of the the ties between local aristocrats and their communities. So I mean, why is that? Why was that that, that, that lack of civic engagement? Were they just get too concerned with money and just enjoying their lives? What happened there? Um, that's a, it's a good question. I think you could point to a couple of different things. A big piece of it is the rise of the administrative state. Like, so you can, you, again, you can kind of point to the center uh, for, for kind of long-term ramifications for this. But the, in the early empire, it was basically run as a racket between local aristocrats and a really, really small um, actual state. Like, the whole Roman Empire in the first, second, into the beginning of the third centuries, the whole Roman state was basically run by a few hundred bureaucrats at the center, the emperor, and uh, and then the army. Um, and the way that you did that was because the local elites of, of these individual cities, like let's say the the uh, uh, the most important people in Marseille in southern Gaul or Toulouse or uh, or in Carthage, were all really invested in being the most important people in those cities. And it was, and they were the ones who connected the individual people to the to the central state, such as it was. Um, the The average person would go their whole life without without seeing a bureaucrat from the from the actual central government. Over the course of the third century and into the fourth century, this changed. Um, the central government of the Roman Empire became much more heavy handed and much more involved in the day to day lives of the people of the empire, and they kind of cut out these local civic leaders from that process. Like those local civic leaders could take jobs in the in the Roman bureaucracy in this increasingly bureaucratic state. But uh, but that wasn't the same thing as being like a local civic leader. You know, it's the difference between saying, okay, I'm one of the five most important people in Carthage versus I'm an official of the Roman imperial government. It fundamentally changes the relationship between these important people and the and the cities that they live in. And so, you know, at first that doesn't seem like much of a difference, but fast forward a hundred years, it it breaks the ties that bind uh, that bind those communities together. That's really interesting. Um, so, I mean, what did the fall of Rome feel like to the people living through it? Like, did Romans understand like how, something's going on here? Like, I, you mentioned earlier that some people, for some people, they did notice; for other people, they didn't notice. Um, so, what? What I mean, so what did it feel like? Did, did, did were there some people who noticed that there was something going on and that things weren't the same and things weren't going to be the same after this? Yeah, absolutely. There were some people who did notice. There were people, especially in the fifth century. There, are, there are people who were who had come from like the northern parts of Gaul who had kind of fled as refugees to the south, who wrote these excoriating treatments of of what was happening back in their back in their home regions. There were definitely people who noticed that things were different, but. The flip side to that is that there were people who went out of their way to pretend that absolutely nothing was different. So like these hyper literate Roman aristocrats in Gaul, like this is the golden age of them writing letters to each other and writing these and, and, and engaging in kind of literary production. Um, because I think in some ways it's a way of reassuring yourself that things haven't really changed all that much, that you can kind of go on with your life without uh, um Without uh, with, without having to engage with the fact that things are changing, but even them, after a certain point, kind of had to come to grips with that. Like the the case study is a guy named Sidonius Apollinaris, who, uh, in kind of the waning days of the Roman Empire in the West, had been the prefect of the city of Rome. He was from um, like central France in the in the Auvergne. Um, but so like he had tried to have this kind of normal career in the imperial government, but the fact that the whole, that the imperial government was disintegrating meant that he had to go back home. So he goes back home, uh, he writes some letters, he becomes bishop of the city of Clermont, um, but he's like, 
he's still living like any other Roman aristocrat would have a hundred years ago. Eventually, though, the Visigoths come and they try to and they try to take his hometown of Clermont. Um, and at this point, Sidonius, who's a bishop, has to organize the defense of the city from people who are supposed to be allies of uh, of the central imperial government. So there's like a whole process of cognitive dissonance that he has to deal with there, where he has to realize, like, oh no, okay, things actually have changed. Um, but still, even into the sixth century in Italy. There are there are aristocrats who are like basically living exactly the same way that they always have. They're reading the same books. They're living on the same estates. Um, social relations haven't really changed at all. They can go to work for what looks a lot like an imperial government if they want to. Like there's a, a guy named Cassiodorus who wrote hundreds of letters for the for the Ostrogothic kings of Italy, and he's basically working just as he would have in an imperial chancery and in, in imperial archives a hundred years before. You know. Um, but yeah, so some people are aware of it, others aren't. I, th I think like a merchant who was living in the city of Aro, like on the southern French coast, like right at the mouth of the Rhone, so like this this huge commercial hub, like I think that guy, if he was born in 450, would not notice any real meaningful change over the course of his life, even if he lived to be 75 or 80. It's interesting. And I think it's interesting too, um, during this time, we had a, a classist on our podcast a while back ago, Carlin Barton. Um, who wrote about Roman honor, the concept of Roman honor. And she makes the case that in the late part of the empire, beginning about uh, like, you know, the 100, you know, year 100 and going on, that stoicism became really popular amongst the the emperors and the, the elite. Um, and she argues that it was because of all this rapid change that was happening within the empire. Do you have any, I mean, do you agree with that sort of hypothesis that stoicism became sort of the, the way the Romans managed themselves psychologically to, to counter all the change that was happening happening around them? Yeah, I certainly buy that up to, up to an extent. I think up until the point where they started to buy in more to, to, Christ, to Christian theologies, like I think up to that point for sure, like you can still see large echoes of stoicism in the uh, in the writings of a, of a guy named Symmachus, uh, the, one of these, the most blue-blooded of the blue-blooded uh, Roman senatorial aristocrats in the late 4th century. Uh, he was big into stoicism in large part because he had to deal firsthand with these kinds of changes. So I think absolutely that hypothesis holds true then. When you get into the 5th century, um, I think that, Stoi that stoic ideas tend to be uh, replaced or heavily inflected with uh, with more Christian theologies. But I think that that has more to do with the fact that like bish that uh, that bishops were becoming um, more important civic leaders. So to that point, like if you're going to be a bishop, well, you'd probably better do some theological reading and writing too. Right. And I guess you could make the case too that as the the fall happened and they started this sort of military ethos began building up again amongst Romans that they would kind of reject stoicism and go back to that sort of primal honor where you know which is yeah. the, the ethos of the warrior yeah absolutely like like that guy Sidonius Apollinaris that I mentioned right like this uh, you know a totally civic minded had no interest at all in military matters none so like when he's organizing the defense of Claremont like it's very clear from reading his letters that he has no idea what he's doing um Sidonius Apollinaris's son led a military contingent uh in a Visigothic army uh like 30 years after that like so, at that point, you can start to see that kind of transformation of this old Roman-style civic uh, civic virtue into something more military. Slowly but surely, you can see the process happening. Like it's uh, like you can trace it across generations where you have that, uh, where we have enough information to do it. You can see it happening. Like it's a like it's a clear process. All right. All right so, Patrick, we're going to do some fall of the Roman Empire parallelism. I don't know if you're a fan of this, but I mean, people sure, sure. do that, right? So like writers and pundits, they, they make the comparisons between Roman America now, because Rome, America is the, the new Roman empire. You know, we're not, in, we're not, some people, okay, some, some people argue we're, we're in, in, we have a political empire, but definitely we have a cultural empire, an economic empire. Have you, based on your approach to the fall of Rome, um, do you see similarities between the American empire, quote unquote, and the Roman empire? Yes, in the sense that you that we're living in an increasingly unipolar world, right, where there really is not a superpower to rival the United States, and that I think is the best analog for uh, that the Roman Empire is the best analog for us to try try and understand our own position in the world. Um, thinking about the Roman Empire and thinking about America in the 21st century allows us to ask questions. Uh, it, it'll, I think that's that's the great benefit of history is that it allows us to ask educated questions about ourselves, even if even if you're not going to find exactly 
exact parallels. By thinking really hard about the parallel, we learn something more. We learn something more about ourselves. So I think asking, "What does a unipolar world look like, where you only have one, uh, where you only have one real superpower?" Um, asking that kind of question of how did the Romans deal with that? How did they manage the world beyond their borders? Allows us to learn some things about ourselves. So, like, the Romans were, the Romans didn't just put up walls and. Uh, and sit behind them and, and just, you know, wait for the barbarians to come across. The Romans were engaged in actively managing what happened beyond their border. So I think that that's that's one distinct parallel between uh, between the United States and the between the United States and the Roman world. You have to you have to see that like they didn't retreat inwards. They were actively involved in trying to in, in trying to uh, keep under control what was happening beyond their world. So Patrick, this has been a great conversation, um, but there's a lot more we could get into and you do that on your podcast. So where can people listen to The Fall of Rome? Uh, you, my podcast, uh, The Fall of Rome, can be found on iTunes. It can be found on Stitcher. It can be found on Google Play. Basically, any platform from which you listen to podcasts, it can be found there. Um, you, uh, I post pretty regular updates, and I'm always down to talk about it on Twitter at Patrick underscore Wyman. Um, you can send me messages on Facebook, too. Uh, search, for, search for my page there, Patrick Wyman. Um, but I will actually have a brand new episode coming up very shortly. As soon as we're done, I'm going to sit down and record the new one. Awesome. Well, Patrick Wyman, thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. My guest today was Patrick Wyman. He's the host of the Fall of Rome podcast. It's available on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, wherever you can listen to a podcast. Uh, check it out. It's really great. And after the shows, check out the show notes at aom.is slash fall of Rome, where you can find links to resources. We can delve deeper into this topic. 